Well, Dr. Werner von Braun, who basically sent men to the moon. Yes, indeed. A very brilliant scientist. Mm -hmm. He said that a lot of people look at science and religion as completely opposing each other. Oh, yes. He said they're not. They're not. He said exactly. they're, they're sisters. While science tries to better understand the creation, yeah. the world around us, religion tries to better understand the creator, who is the one who made the universe, right? And, I mean, it's, it's even more clear when you go out into space and you look down upon the Earth, you see just how spectacular, it's almost like a jewel mm -hmm. that appears to be designed for life. It is. Can you talk to us about well, that? Well, it's interesting. You know, we have a friend of the ministry called Dr. Henry Richter, who is now about over 90 years old, but he actually worked with Werner von Braun. So he uh, was part of the, the pioneering space program. Yeah. So he, and he's a biblical creationist who just says exactly what you say, that Earth is specially designed for life. He is even a book he's called, called Spaceship Earth. It's, it's the only place in the universe known to have any sort of life. It's perfectly designed in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the theory of most scientists today. They'll say that we're insignificant, and in fact, people who aren't even, they don't have their PhDs in science, people who have popularized science, mm. they teach this as well. People like um, Bill Nye. Right. Oh, Bill Nye, who played a science guy in children's television once, yeah. <laughs> okay, but the thing is, he's also a, a staunch atheist, and when he was award, he was given Humanist of the Year Award, which shows how, how staunch an atheist he is. He's, I'm insignificant, I'm just another speck of sand, and the Earth is just another speck, and the Sun, an unremarkable star. The galaxy's a speck. I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck among other specks, among still other specks, in the middle of specklessness. I suck. Okay, he said it, not me, wow. okay? Um, the point is, uh, the Earth is... Is, is tiny in size, but he makes out that this is some sort of modern discovery, yeah. which it clearly is not. Okay. And also, the sun is not an unremarkable star. It's in the top 10% of all stars. Main, and it's, main sequence G2. Yeah, G2, yeah. but it's also extremely stable. Even for G2 stars, it's a very stable star. Other stars like that have uh, giant flares. The sun has quite tiny flares, but other stars are very active. So our sun is uniquely uh, quiescent for a star, uh, ideal for life on, on a planet. Let's talk about those giant flares for a second. If our sun had these giant flares, will those flares carry radiation, solar wind, mm. things that would be damaging, They'd correct? They blow our atmosphere away, you see. Okay. That's a huge problem. Okay. But the sun is a, is a remarkably quiescent, unique star. Also, it's not a double star. Like Alpha Centauri, the nearest star uh, to our system, yes. it's a double star. That would be good for planets. You couldn't have a planet going around uh, two Multiple stars. Multiple stars. Because you get hugely different um, climates when you try and do it. Okay? Oh, okay. It's a bad news. And the red dwarf star, you have to get so close to be bright enough that you'd be exposed to their flare, their super flares, and you'd be tidally locked like the moon is to Earth. Okay, you oh. have the same face towards the star, which is no good because you have permanent day on one side, permanent night on the other side. Ugh, hopeless. So you're saying if, if our sun was much smaller than, than the the planet would have to be much closer yes. to stay warm enough, and that would cause synchronous rotation, it would. meaning we would have constant burning up summers on one side yeah. and constant night and freezing, freezing cold on the other. Exactly. That's, that's not any, so you'd have this tiny, tiny rim around the... The, the, the Terminator, The right? Terminator, right? Goodness, uh, that wouldn't work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but also the sun is in a very good position in our galaxy. It's, it's called the co-rotation radius, uh -huh. which means that it rotates the same speed as a spiral arm. So it means it stays in the same relative position. Okay. So it doesn't cross the spiral arms and therefore expose you to collisions with other stars and, and, and things. So in the co-rotation is the ideal radius for a, a life-bearing solar system. Wow. So we wouldn't want to be in the center of the other of galaxies. There's a black hole there, which will swallow us up, which is no fun. <laughs> so what does he usually want? Uh -huh. um, we're in a good position. Yeah. But the other thing that he doesn't seem to realize is that the tininess of the earth in size was well known to the medieval church. Okay. I mean, because you go to uh, Ptolemy, who, was, uh, the, who wrote the te astronomy textbook throughout the entire Middle Age until Galileo, this was, uh, 1,500 years, this was the standard astronomy textbook. Uh huh. And he said the Earth, in relation to the distance of the fixed stars, has no appreciable size and must be treated as a mathematical point. Everyone knew this in the Middle Ages because astronomy was a compulsory subject for the universities, which, by the way, were also invented in the Middle Ages, modelled on the theological colleges. Okay. So the so-called Dark Ages invention. They invented the university, for goodness sake. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and this is, was, uh, astronomy was taught to all the clergy and they had to study astronomy, and so they would have learned about 
the tininess of the Earth Our in universe. size. Yeah. Okay. In fact, Aristarchus before Christ proved the sun was much bigger than the Earth. Oh, really? Okay. So he proved that. Yeah, so there was common knowledge. Uh -huh. And then they realized since the, the stars are so far away from us, uh, they must be very big for us to be able to see them. Mm -hmm. So they understood that every, even the tiniest star we see in the sky is bigger than the Earth. Wow. They all knew that. Okay. You see? Uh, and yet this was all, common knowledge. It's common knowledge right throughout the, the church era. You see, the, the so-called dark ages, they knew this perfectly well. So I'd say this is a case of a busted myth uh, that the universe thought, uh, they, they thought the earth was uh, big and the universe was po pokey and small. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson said that on his rebooted cosmos. Yep. It's complete ignorance of history which these guys promulgate. Unfortunately, our government schools don't do a good job of teaching proper history. No. And it, then, it's, yeah. it's revision, revised history in many yeah. cases. It, it, it revised history in so many ways, and we want to talk about the flat earth here in a bit. Yes. But, uh, you know, even I was taught in school textbooks that Galileo, I mean, that uh, Columbus thought he was going to fall off the edge of the flat earth. I mean, oh, my goodness. Ridiculous yes. things where long before people knew about these things, and mm. Christians many times had the upper hand. Why did they have the upper hand? Well, because they believed in a faithful uh, creator, God, creator God, who is a God of all He wasn't the God of confusion. He'd given us the dominion mandate in Genesis 1, 20, uh, 28, before the fall, mm -hmm. and therefore we're supposed to investigate, which means the universe must be orderly, and we're supposed to find out how it works. Yes. If God hasn't revealed certain things in the Bible, the only way we find out how it works is to go and do tests on it. Okay. And that's where the foundation of experimental science grew up in the Christian worldview and was still born in ancient Greece, ancient China, ancient Rome, but only really flourished in medieval Europe and then even more in the Reformation period. Fascinating. Let's talk about the motion of the earth, the sun, and all of that. Well, okay, it's very interesting that when you go back to the medieval time, you see, because they understood the, the, the stars were so far away, the, 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 they were in some sort of celestial sphere which must be massive, and mm -hmm. the Earth is tiny by comparison, or maybe uh, the Earth's what's rotating and not the not the cosmos. You see, ah. This is proposed by Nicole Oreim, who is a bishop in good standing in the church, the, probably the greatest of all the medieval science, scientists. In fact, he anticipated some of the things that Galileo was supposed to have discovered 250 years later. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is, okay, if we're on the Earth and it's moving, why don't we feel it? It's because, he said, that everything is going to move with the Earth. So the Earth is sharing its motion with everything on it, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere. Mm. Uh, I mean... Most of us here have been on airplanes, right? Yeah. Okay, we go, say, 500 miles an hour. No. But when the hostess pours the drink for you, it the comes drink vertically, doesn't, doesn't it? It doesn't fly 500 exactly. miles an hour down to the back now, of the plane. If you were looking at uh, like a Wonder Woman, a transparent plane or something yeah. like that, you looked at it, you see everything moving at 500 miles an hour. But when oh. you're on the plane, you think you're sitting still and everything else is moving with you. That's mm. what, what they realised in the Middle Ages. Yes. Uh, and then you look... Um, to Galileo, which is supposed to be the most famous of the controversies. And in fact, a lot of the opposition came from the secular science of the day. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, Ooh, the world. Okay. Yeah. But because, I mean, let's, we shouldn't fall for the fallacy of presentism that we judge the past by what we know today. We have to judge by the past by what they, what was available to them. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, in those days, it really wasn't a, a slam dunk for the Galileo side. Yeah. I think the evidence known to them was probably in favour of, of a stationary Earth. Okay. Okay, back then, I think now, of course, uh, uh, we've got very good evidence of, of the sun moving, of yep. the Earth moving around the sun and rotating once a day. I agree with that. But back then, did they have the knowledge to do that? No, I don't think so. Hmm. So, and also, they a lot of the... The problem was the Aristotelian philosophy. Yep. Okay, so... Uh, Aristotle said the Earth had to be stationary. That was the dogma of the day. Uh, while a lot of the church actually was in favour of Galileo's idea, they thought it was pretty good. They thought nothing wrong with it, with it from a theological perspective, and they thought, well, go ahead and publish it. We don't hear this. We hear, we hear that the church was, was so opposed to any new scientific discovery. Well, in fact, the church was actually the foundation of, of a lot of the scientific discovery. Wow. I mean, they even had their cathedrals used as giant uh, observatories. They're called the Meridiane. You had a hole in the, in the, in the roof for the sun, so it's like a giant reverse sundial. They plotted the path of the sun. So oh, that's wow. actually better than the telescopes of the day was their, their giant uh, observatories that they used their cathedrals for because they were stable, good quality buildings. They, they did not rock. So very good for making measurements of of the way the sun moved, and they actually proved Kepler's laws from the Meridiana. They could tell the sun, 
sides appear to be getting smaller and larger, which is consistent with us moving in an elliptical orbit around the sun. OK, so they actually were at the forefront of scientific astronom astronomical advances. Yeah.